Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, Montessa Lee, who is gracious enough to agree to share her story. Um, Montessa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, before we start, you know, I'd like to ask just for people to share a little bit more about themselves outside of the cancer context, right? Because we're so much more than just that story. So um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. I appreciate that, you know, that we can't be defined by a box. So my lucrative job, as I would call it, beyond the advocacy is I'm a mentor teacher and specifically I work with novice teachers. My background is a special educator. Um, I have a master's in autism and in inclusion. So I, I really prefer working in our um, populations in our schools that have autism or any teacher that is working with a large group of um, children with special needs. Oh, that's fantastic. So I do work for that and I've turned some of the advocacy work I've learned from lung cancer into educate, education. And I am currently a doctoral student as well. So all of these things, I, I don't know how I could keep my calendar <laughs> and my mind managed. <laughs> and that's why I appreciate so much that you made the time for us. I know you're incredibly busy. Thank you for the work you do outside of the advocacy work in cancer, um, working with um, you know, people and kids with special needs. That's so important, obviously. So, so thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know that there's a, a lot because you went from being a, a patient and survivor and thriver to advocate, and it's it's a lot of what you do. So let's dive into your story, which I know in the beginning you you told me you had some first symptoms of some chest pain, some shortness of breath. Walk us through how you finally got to learning what you were dealing with. Yep. So in 2006, in September, I had um, chest pain, like a cough, went to, uh, and I, I remember because it was, it was a day in September where we were having a going away party. I have a friend in the military and the Navy, and she was going to be stationed away. That's, that, that's probably why that date and month stick in my head. And um, went to the urgent care clinic. They poked around and said, oh, you have costeochondritis, inflammation around the rib cage. And it sounded legitimate because I had been working out that summer, you know, pulling weights. So I, and I don't know, you know, you trust the medical professionals. So I walked away and said, okay, they gave me Motrin, it went on about my business. Um, then I developed, actually, I don't know if I had a cough at the time. I, I, if it was, it wasn't as bad, but I developed a cough that wouldn't go away, a lingering cough. The chest pain was still there, went to a primary care doctor. And this was a new doc doctor. So I had never seen this doctor before going to meet her, um, they said, oh, you have bronchitis. Never gave me an x-ray. Now at the time, I didn't know I was supposed to have, I'm 28 years old, didn't know I was supposed to have an x-ray for bronchitis. I work in a school system with kids. I was like, yeah, sounds legitimate. <laughs> maybe the kids got sick. I, maybe I just got sick. Um, and then she said, you have a whopping heart murmur. Did anybody tell you that? I was like, no, nobody has ever told me this in my life that I had a heart murmur. So she was keen to the heart murmur went to, you know, go send me to go get an echocardiogram, but never gave me an x-ray and sent me home with an inhaler and antibiotics. November, I remember driving um, home to North Carolina. My parents are, I'm originally from North Carolina. I live in Maryland now. I had back pain um, and I would have back pain throughout. Even my teachers would later tell me that I was working with, that I would complain about back pain, but I didn't connect the two and went to, um, you know, like I, by December, the first week in December, I was in grad school at the time too for my master's and um, the pain came back. I, I lived with my cousin at the time. I called her and said, you know, the chest pain came back. You have to take me to the ER. Um, and she's like, oh no. And, and she had told me too, that the cough was still there even after I had finished the antibiotics. And I said, oh, you know, I made another appointment. Maybe it just lingers. I, I don't know how bronchitis works. And um, she said, shouldn't that cough be gone? It, you know, so red flags are coming out. And I went to the ER at the, the regular hospital this time. I was in so much pain. And ironically, by the time I got home from the grad school, I, and me, I'm like, oh, I have to take a test. <laughs> you know, I'm going, I have no idea even how I made it through the test because I was really in pain. But um, the pain had kind of subsided. And I was like, oh, I want to eat something. I'm not worried. But I said, maybe the ER can give me some medicine. So, so go ahead and take me you know, to the CR. And she took me um, and they immediately hospitalized me after hooking me up to um, the pulse sock, realizing my oxygen level was 
like like 83 or 85. And um, they did an x-ray and, and said, we found a mass and we're keeping you. And, I, and all I heard was IV, which meant needle in my head, <laughs> biopsy, which meant surgery. And I was like, I have to go to work in the morning. And I can't, <laughs> I can't stay here. Yeah. I don't but, have time for this. <laughs> yes. And they said, you want to see the x-ray? No, because my cousin's yelling at you know I'm sitting in the bed if you could imagine you know sitting in the chair, she's standing above me. They found a mass in your lung. You're staying, and I'm like, mm, no, you know I'm walk. You know in my head I'm thinking like somehow I'm functioning. I'm walking around. Right. right. I, I don't. I can't afford these bills. I'm a teacher. I, you know, not knowing like oh, the fear of the unknown. Like right now it's all okay. questions. And um, I said, yeah, let me let me see. You know, I had I had no idea what I was going to see, but the way I describe it to people is if you're looking. If, if you have no knowledge of what your lungs are supposed to look like, if you look up in a dark sky with some binoculars, you'll see dark lobes and maybe some white lines. But imagine someone taking a paper towel, balling it up and covering one of those lenses. So three fourths of my lung on the left side was not visible. Wow. Only one fourth was visible. And that's how large a 15 centimeter mass by the time they found it. Wow. And, and that's, is so when you visually saw this, is that when it hit you? Yeah. The one I said, <laughs> I looked and I said, my cousin said, oh, and I said, oh, I guess I'm staying. <laughs> right. I, you know, I guess I'm staying. I, I still had no idea. Um, At that time, they were like, just whispering, you know, things like, oh, it's, it's possibly cancer, possibly not. Um, We don't know, you know, we're still going to do, I mean, actually before they, they, they said they were going to do all this before I saw that the scan yeah. and then it made sense that yes I understand mass now has visualized in my mind what a mass is that you're talking about right um, right right and, and, and things that. started coming clear like why I was having trouble sleeping thought it was my pillow yeah you know, everything else right right because who's thinking and you're 28 you're healthy um yeah. not smoking not drinking I mean it's, it just doesn't occur to you of course doesn't occur to you and right. so at that time they're saying mass they're saying maybe cancer but are you thinking, oh, I have cancer or are you wait, is it still not really in your mind yet? And you're thinking, well, this might just be some weird anomaly. Yeah. And that's where my normal temperament would have been pessimistic. Like, oh, well, it's me, you know, go into like a hypochondriac mood. But that's where my faith comes in. And, and, and part of the book that I ended up writing, um, that, that a faith, you know, I, I heard a voice of life whisper to me and say, you know, this is not, this is going to be bad. Mm -hmm. but it's not going to kill you. It's going to be a healing testimony for someone right. by, beyond yourself. And so I didn't know at the time whose story yeah. <laughs> this was for or, or what kind of journey I was going to go down. But my normal, I had to hear that because my normal temperament would have been, oh, let me lay in the bed. You know, you know I would have been like worry wart, you know, negative Nancy the whole <laughs> way through the journey. I, I, you know, I, that's so inspiring to know that you, you had this voice, um, by the way, though, I don't think anyone will fault you for being a negative Nancy in this circumstance, yeah. <laughs> given what you'd seen. Um, so Montessa, I, I know you, so they, this is a 15 centimeter mass. You're like, okay, this is really real. Right. Uh, at that point, did they immediately hospitalize you and do the first biopsy? And can you walk us through, I know you went through a needle guided biopsy followed by an open chest biopsy. Um, can you describe also those those um, procedures for people who are also going to undergo one. Oh yes, and I, and I guess because everything happened rapidly, I didn't have time. You don't have time to process when you're sick like that. But they did immediately hospitalize me. That was um, the first time I was hospitalized, and they did the needle guided biopsies where you sit on something like a CAT scan or ultrasound, and they can visually look at where they're doing the biopsy, and they get like a syringe or a needle and take out the tissue. Your um. I believe I was awake, you know, it was not as invasive. And I got a call back probably like at the end of that week um, and said, hey, we didn't get enough tissue sample. You have to come back in for an open chest biopsy. And the doctors and surgeons were going back and forth, I think, because the theory of cells spreading, you know, I, I didn't know all the science behind it, but you know, what they were explaining at the time. And they, I went back probably like a week later, they did an open chest biopsy the surgeon at the time was trying to connect me with an oncologist, but my cousin who worked at another hospital, we were gonna go his route and said, hey, you know, 
who's the best oncologist you can recommend for, he, he was actually on the call the whole time because he didn't believe it the first time I was in the hospital with 15 centimeter mass. He told my aunt, you must be mistaken. It is not a 15 centimeter mass. It's probably, I see, I had no idea that it was huge. Even though I saw that, I didn't know it was abnormal, Give it abnormally huge. I, you know, I just said, okay, it's, it's the size of a cantaloupe. This is, the doctors are very calm telling me these things um, until I went later on do advocacy and they were like that was humongous you know, so, you know or, and I was the the talk of the water cooler probably because everybody would come in and say did you have any was anything like lifting up you know did you did, did you visibly show anything you know yeah. so that was probably the medical student there you know <laughs> <laughs> and it, and after they did that open chest biopsy it wasn't until I met my oncologist that I got even though they were trying to they probably knew because the surgeon was trying to connect me with a oncologist I didn't um, get the diagnosis till I met maybe that, that next week early that next week with my oncologist right I know it's a whirlwind in that time there's like mm -hmm. it's just one thing after another and, and that open chest biopsy uh where you you were under for that then right yes mm -hmm. okay and you woke up it was fine you didn't have a lot of pain or anything yeah no I just remember them telling me that I did break down and cry at that time because they were like oh we can't fully I don't know why they tell patients some things you know they're like we can't fully um sedate you. And so my mind, I was thinking I was going to be awake, but it was something more with the, I guess, the intubation or something, something they couldn't do because me laying down flat on my back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to breathe. Um, mm -hmm. But I still was out enough that I did not remember anything until I- Good. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Um, so it was after that biopsy that I know you put December 19th, you met the oncologist again, and, and that was when you got the full diagnosis. What do you remember of that day? What he or she said to you? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I remember, um, and, and, and he was very, very calm. I went there with another, I have a, a large family here. And, and before my mom came up from North Carolina, my family was driving, my extended family was driving me back and forth. So another cousin, a, a male cousin at this time, we were in the office and the oncologist said, it's, it's really a stupid name. He said, you know, we used to call it oat cell cancer because it looks like oats in the microscope and now it's small cell lung cancer and my cousin and I looked at each other and laughed and said that is a dumb name you know <laughs> and, and so he you know he said oh we're gonna hospitalize you and, and start streaming xyz I said oh can you give me one more day my my mom and my aunt they're coming in I think it was like a Wednesday I said they're coming in on Friday give me this one day before I have to go back in the hospital and uh, uh I don't know if he willingly <laughs> you know he he caved in and let me wait one day until they arrived um it might have been a Tuesday. i can't remember the exact day but it was one day in between and he let me wait um and then immediately i was back in the hospital again okay did they give you stage or anything like that as well no i looked at the paper um i remember i, I haven't but at that time i don't even think eventually at some point it was probably after i got out of the hospital i started looking up uh what small cell was you know i i, I had no reference my grandfather had died uh, lung cancer, but mm. I still had really no reference of how deadly the disease was, especially the difference between small cell and non-small cell. And I think the paper said um, advanced. It might have said extensive because usually it's extensive or limited. Now I know I had limited, but I don't know if the doctor put it on there as a <laughs> as a call to to speed up the process of, of things. But I um, or because the tumor was so large at the time, and he just put the stage there because yeah. it was in the medius, um, they think it was in the lung, but by the time they found it, it was in the mediastinum area, mm -hmm. but it had not metastasized anywhere else. But he, um, and I looked at it, I was like, I'm walking around. What is, you know, I'm thinking like, how could this be right? You know, I, cause again, I was somewhat still, my body wasn't functioning at a hundred percent by any means, but I'm still, you know, I'm going day to day at work and then immediately everything stops. Right, everything just changed, but at the same time, you're still you. It's this really yeah. weird mm -hmm. um, sort of dichotomy. So at that point, how did he, your oncologist tell you what the treatment would be? And what was the sense you got, I guess, about whether you want to describe it as prognosis or just what your life would be like coming up in the next year? And I think I had, looking back, I had no, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't wrap my head around. It. I mean, you know, I, I took what he said and heard okay, you're going to start chemo, your hair might fall out, might not. My patients usually don't get um, nauseous because I give them X, Y, Z. I, and I remember him talking about the type of chemo I was on, your kidneys to drink up a lot of water, 
and I'm surprised I could remember all this, you, you know, but, but he was telling me all of these things and um, he didn't talk much about the, I mean, he did say we start radiation, but he, the radiation oncologist talked more about that treatment side. And he said, um, I think he said like six or eight cycles of chemo and um, we're gonna start, actually they started a pick line first before I had another surgery um, to start the first dose when I was hospitalized at the chemotherapy. Um, and then I, you know, I didn't know about some of these other things like issues with, I had fluid around my heart. So I had to end up getting a periocardial window when I was hospitalized at that time. They put a metaport in. I don't even remember him telling me if I was getting a metaport, but you know, it was, it, it was the best thing that could have happened when they did that surgery as well to put the metaport in. And I was there longer, I think, than they thought because the fluid wouldn't drain off from that periocardial window. Okay. Um, and, and I remember him coming in because it was around Christmas time too. So he was he was out for a portion, not out, but like on vacation, I guess. Right. And you, you had your physician assistants and things right. coming during it's that been, time. He's in the holidays. And so of course you're dealing with that as another layer. Um, as we wrap up this segment and before we move on to treatment decisions and the actual treatment that you went through, um, two questions for me. One is, uh, how did you break the news? I mean, I hear you have a lot of family. and So how did you break the news to your loved ones? I think people sometimes struggle with that. I know it's personal, but just curious how you handled it. Um, and then if you ended up ever considering a second opinion. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I think I, th that's a good question because I don't even know if I called anyone to tell them. I, you know, my my cousin who was with me at the time, who lived with me, she called the, the doctor. Well, actually, she called, she called my aunt, and she told her to call um, my cousin Keith, who, who's an interventional radiologist at the hospital, and get us connected. So we got on the ball, and Keith also called over to the hospital to talk to the doctors um, to see what, you know, to get the doctor language and get what was going on, um, and then somehow. <laughs> Oh, my cousin called my parents, said I was in the hospital. They called another aunt, you know, so the chain got passed through. My dad would always say, look, well, he'll use me as an example. Tell Montessa, telephone, telegraph, tell Montessa, it'll, it'll, it'll get around. <laughs> or, you know, so whoever they told and the, the chain got passed. And um, she, the cousin I live with knew some of my close friends from work. Mm. So she called them and they connected with my principal and they ended up coming to the hospital that night, three of my um, really good friends from okay. work. From work. So what I'm hearing is really, and you were okay with this, uh, you had basically your inner circle, the people closest to you disseminate, and that yeah. took something off your plate, right? You didn't right. have to then worry about being the, the telephone, playing the game. Right. Okay, right. that's great, that's great. Yeah. Um, and then, so I know you, you did, you had mentioned you sought out the best oncologist and you were trying to look around. Do you have any guidance for people when it comes to second opinions? Yes, I think, um, you know, and I've met several people now, you know, going on that had second opinions. I um, I just didn't, I, I probably would not have, I, I was very happy with my oncologist, but I, if I had went with the, the one that the um, surgeon originally, but I trusted my family. So I went with him and, but I think people need to get second opinions. Um, I've met several people now, you know, all these years later, it's several people that needed to get a second opinion, whether it's, I have a friend now dealing with a different type of cancer who, um, because she didn't want this radical surgery that they had recommended at first to, to go, you know, we have to be educated. So all they can do is tell you no or yes, you know, if you go get the second opinion. And if you like, maybe even you, I didn't necessarily go to one, I won't, I won't name the hospital, one treatment center because I had a coworker who, said they treated her kind, her husband kind of like a, a specimen or a research project. So they weren't looking at a holistic approach and I needed somebody a little bit more personable. So I thought of if I went there, but you know, I just wanted to stick with my oncologist. Yeah, you had a good rapport, good relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think I hear a lot from people. It's a combination of that relationship, feeling like you can trust them and, yes. and it's, mm -hmm. it's a gut decision. So that sounds great. Um, okay, great. So thank you, Montessa. We're going to move on to the second segment where we'll talk about um, the actual treatment, undergoing chemo, radiation, and recovering. So okay. stick with us. Mm -hmm. 